Welcome, my name is Chris Thompson. I am the executive director here at Generator, and I want to thank you all for coming. I can't tell you how thrilled I am about how well this Jumpstart program is going. Unless I'm counting wrong, I think we will have had so far over 300 emerging entrepreneurs participating in the program. And this is the fifth of, of six uh, lecture workshops. And, uh, you, know, I, you know, amongst other things, I can't really thank John Antonucci and LaunchBT enough. It's been an amazing experience uh, working with him, and he's done an incredible job with this. But now I've got some stuff I've got to talk about. First off, we've got Clay, one of our Jumpstart cohort. Remember, along with you guys who are learning in the audience here, we have a cohort who we are actually we are supporting with financially with a stipend. We're giving them a studio. We're hooking them up with mentors and prototyping specialists. Our whole where's Where's the stipend? Where, where are the cohort? There's Jake, Christine, there you go. So uh, Courtney, the, uh, and Clay couldn't be here tonight, unfortunately, because he's opening a show over at, believe it or not, Karma Birdhouse, where, uh, where Michael Jagger is, is, is from. So we, we have a, you know, a, little, a little interesting convergence there. Um, but he's actually opening a show of the work that he's been working on for this program. So I hope you'll head over there and, uh, yeah, so that's open tonight. It's started all, uh, starting at 6, so he should be open in just a little while. A um, couple things first. Uh, before I do anything else, I just want to make a, a quick statement, which is that Generator is a social impact nonprofit. And that means what we do is we go out and we raise money to uh, put together uh, this incredible program. This program all the things we do for the members, a half million dollars in tools to help uh, emerging entrepreneurs. And we do that to have an impact on the community. And so I'm gonna take a moment just to say, you know, if you have capacity, if you know anybody else who has capacity, if you have a rich uncle who's excited about this or you're excited about this, what I'd love you to do is tell them how excited they are. Have them give me a call, I'd be happy to give them a tour. I mean, it's a real, exciting opportunity to participate and I really you know just encourage you we're happy to talk to anybody who might want to support us so that's quickly that I want to th uh, thank our supporters of um, of the uh, jumpstart program um, first though I'm going to hand it over to Dave Estes he's from People's United Bank thank you um, just a a quick hello. I'm Dave Estes. I'm a commercial lender and senior vice president at People's United Bank. And so I typically am giving larger loans. And I will tell you what, we have been um, helpful in giving some startup organizations, you know, some loans that they've really grown into, grown into big companies. So I hope to see all of you someday and be able to help all of you. You know, this is my third chance to um, welcome all of you. And I see a number of familiar faces um, in the energy and the enthusiasm and the motivation that you all exude makes me kind of think of a good second career for myself. So maybe someday I'll be joining you. But so on behalf of People's United Bank, thanks so much for the work you do. And um, we're so glad that we're able to support you. So good luck. So in addition to People's United, I want to thank Davis and Hodgkin's Associates, Merit and Merit Lawyers for Growth Companies, Fresh Tracks Capital, Middlebury College, m and &E Design, Center for Women and Enterprise Vermont, BTV Ignite, Green Mountain Power, and our media sponsor, uh, RETN. In just a second, I'm going to turn it over to John Antonucci, but first I want to say, super excited about tonight because I actually had the privilege for seven, nearly eight years of working with Michael Jagger at Jagger DePaula Kemp Design, and they were some of the most influential years of my life. Totally an amazing experience. I hope we get a little sense of that tonight, and I'm gonna turn it over to John now. Hello, everyone. Uh, yeah, as Chris said, uh, pretty awesome to have Michael here with us tonight, uh, and I'm gonna introduce him in a minute, but before I get started, show of hands if you've been to an event before. Sweet, yeah, to one of the Jumpstart events. Uh, anyone been to all five? This is, this is all five of them. Awesome, thank you, that's great. Uh, anyone here for the first time? Come into it, okay. 
cool. So that's great. We've got some repeat uh, customers and also some people coming out for the first time. And uh, just as a reminder, we're filming all of these and they're available on the generator uh, web page, website on the Jumpstart page um, right underneath each of the uh, workshop descriptions. And so we have one more in two weeks. Uh, that's about funding your startup. And Karn Cross, another uh, you know, expert in his field is going to be here sharing his wisdom with you about you know, different ways to get your, fund up, uh, your startup funded. So uh, my name is John Antonucci and I'm the Director of Entrepreneurship at the Lake Champlain Chamber of Commerce. And the Chamber about five years ago started this project called Launch VT with a simple idea of giving entrepreneurs some resources, some, you know, some mentors, uh, and some leadership training, some content knowledge, and a little bit of capital and an opportunity to get some exposure in the community. Uh, and it's grown steadily over the last five years and um, we have now morphed into partnerships with other organizations uh, here in the community and it's really wonderful that we've been able to provide early stage acceleration programs and resources to the people who are uh, the lifeblood of our economy and really our community because we all know that entrepreneurs and small business owners are much more than just um, you know making a service or a product they're here they're employing people they're paying taxes uh, and they're spreading wealth throughout the community and oftentimes providing goods and services that are solving real problems um, for us uh, either socially or environmentally so um, I first want to thank all of you for being here and for doing what you do uh, our community wouldn't be what it is without you uh, secondly I am just thrilled uh, to be part of this project uh, when Chris approached us about this we didn't know what we were gonna do exactly but uh, we put our heads together and we came up with a really great uh, project and a format for this and the, uh, the speakers that we've been able to bring in have been truly amazing. And the cohort is so damn cool. Um, I get to come here every session for an hour before it starts and work with them. Uh, and I enjoy that time so much. And it's so inspiring to me to work with them. Uh, and so I'm, I'm, on behalf of LaunchVT and the Chamber, so excited to be part of the Generator Maker community. Um, as Dave was just saying, it's such an inspiring place to be. Uh, and, and I draw a lot of energy uh, and um, motivation for the future from this group. So um, I did want to tell you guys that uh, this is one, one of our newest programs, but we have a, a couple other longstanding programs. One is called Launch VT Collegiate, and that just concluded a couple of weeks ago, where we do a pitch competition for students at colleges who have real businesses. Uh, and then the winner of that event, who happened to be from Vermont Technical College and have developed a new tool for um, tapping trees and working with tubing, uh, they uh, get an automatic spot in our major pitch and acceleration um, program called Launch VT, uh, which starts up in April. But I wanted to just let you know that the application period is open for that um, acceleration program. Uh, applications are due by March uh, 16th. So please, if you've got a startup, whatever phase you're at, you don't have to have everything figured out. Uh, you've got a great idea, um, even if you don't have your team fully formed or any revenue in the door yet, uh, if you're going for it, Check out LaunchVT.com and fill out the application. You never know. Um, we give away over $100,000 in cash and in-kind services. So um, with that, I want to just transition into uh, introducing our awesome speaker tonight. So he really needs no introduction. I mean, you're all out here for a reason. But uh, by way of just celebrating his excellence, um, Michael Jagger is, is world-renowned for his design, um, and he has offered so much to this community, not just in his brand work, but um, throughout all of his uh, companies that he's worked with and for. Um, and so, as you guys know, he started JDK Design, grew it into a massive marketing um, firm, uh, which had a huge impact on national brands like Xbox and Nike, um, and then Seventh Generation and other local companies who have just done great things here. Uh, his, he's won awards, he's been internationally recognized, uh, and then just, you know, uh, the new chapter of sort of that development um, became the Karma Birdhouse, which is a whole different thing. Um, and it's providing a home or a nest to some, some of the most exciting and, and awesome companies uh, in, in the state and in the region. And if you don't know some of the stories that have come out of there, it's really, it, it's why I do what I do, because this community is so awesome. So he might talk a little bit about it tonight. but. Companies like Mamava, who are completely shaking up uh, the world, really, um, but certainly society with their, their breastfeeding pods, uh, you know, that, that came out of JDK Design. Um, and that, that got incubated and, and grew at Karma Birdhouse. And so you know, what Michael's work is doing, uh, his legacy on, on this community is really amazing. So um, he now uh, runs the Solidarity of Unbridled Labor, um, his, in which he uh, does his, his current design work. Um, he's 
spun out brands uh, like Mamava, but also others that are recognizable in this community. And so he's going to talk to you tonight about building what he calls a living brand uh, and his philosophy on design, which is truly inspiring. So please join me in giving a big round of applause for Michael Jagger. Wow, that was very kind. Whew. And you all braved it through the, uh, through the weather and actually made, made it out here. So thank you for, uh, for doing that. It's really uh, a Vermont thing. You actually you pulled it off. Um, so the revolution will be synchronized. That's going to be the, the theme for, for tonight. Uh, and we'll, uh, we'll dissect what some of that means here upcoming. But I wanted to thank Launch VT, Jumpstart, Generator, Peoples United, uh, to have that group come together, sort of exemplary of the whole point of a revolution being synchronized. If we don't have community efforts that really bring the right minds together and we don't kind of push and pull ideas around, uh, we're not going to accomplish a lot of the work that really needs to be done. Uh, and uh, one, one reminder quote that I use, I don't know how many of you like Charles Bukowski, but he's one of my favorite poets. And he has, uh, it's actually the title of a book and a poem, but uh, the days run away like wild horses over the hills. Uh, and that's a good reminder for me every time I, I wake up in the morning, that things uh, time-wise are very precious. And we're in a really amazing position, I think, in the creative and the design world to have a profound effect on what is happening and what can positively change in the world through the ideas that we make and the ideas and the purpose that we put into the work that we do. So I think we need to keep in mind urgency and synchronization tonight when we talk about ideas and talk about brand. And I'll, I'll tell you a few theories, at least, and hard lessons I've learned about uh, the concept of what a brand is. So that's kind of where we'll begin. Is everybody good with that? And we'll hang out for a little bit? All right, cool. So starting again, here we go. So uh, a little bit of introduction, I guess, as far as context for Solidarity of Unbridled Labor. A lot of people are like, that is the most bizarre name for a design studio I ever, ever thought of. There's certainly a lot of nice little crisp one word design studio names, but it is important for context to think about at least a perspective on how we view the world. So Solidarity of Unbridled Labor is named what it is because it's really wearing on our sleeve what we believe. Design is about solidarity of intention. That is what the whole thing is about. Any design work that we've been involved in or any idea we've been involved in, when you have a synchronization of intention and everyone understands what question you're trying to answer, that's when you do much more successful work. So solidarity is what we're looking for because it's the most potent place to be thinking and making. Unbridledness, of course, is about creativity and breaking convention and being willing to take a pioneering different, different approach. The labor, and deliberately the European spelling of labor, is there because it's about the collective effort that goes on. It is our collective effort. Uh, there's a lot of discussion in the world about entrepreneurs and entrepreneur owner managers and all these amazing stories of individuals. I actually hate the podcast, How I Built This. Uh, I love the podcast, I love hearing the stories, but I hate the I. It's like any idea that is worthwhile, you are part of something bigger than yourself. And you may have a leader who has vision and helps to guide and, and drive an energy that's unique, but it's always bigger than an I. Anything that's worthwhile in the world, you have to have this ability to collaborate and synchronize. So that's something to keep in mind that is, is going to be a theme, and that's why the synchronized topic came up. But it's our collective labor. The other thing, these boxes aren't just sort of graphic design masturbation and like, oh, these are pretty colors. They're, uh, they're actually meaningful. Uh, a lot of you are probably well aware of Josef Albers and the work with the Bauhaus, and he was one of the founders of the Bauhaus, as well as uh, the Black Mountain College was another profound thing that he and his wife, Ani, worked on. This is reference and homage to his work. Uh, he was the master of the interaction of color. And his theories and belief about how color, one color overlapping another, they change each other. The perceptions are changed and they're affected by each other. This is our sort of metaphorical reminder about what design is and what brand is. The things we do and connect and communicate with an audience change the audience and the things that the audience does change us. And you have to realize that you're in this dynamic relationship. That's, that's at the heart of good idea making. 
So we use this as a vehicle to just visually remind us about what we're involved in. Uh, and it's a living, breathing, never sleeping thing. You can never step in the same river twice. You can never have the same idea happen twice. And we've been fortunate to be part of a couple of things that are pretty unique, that are sort of cultural moments, but those also disappear. And they, and they move and change. So this is just something to remember. I won't talk about every single slide tonight as long as I'm talking about this, but hopefully that sets context for what it is that we're about and what we're doing. So to begin with, as fundamental as this is, what is, what is brand? Uh, a lot of people have different perceptions about that. I mean, certainly a lot of the, a lot of the people in this room would understand that it's more multidimensional than a logo, but there's a lot of people in the world who think, oh, the brand is the logo and the equity in the logo, or it's the product, or, you know, it's, you hear all different kinds of interpretations. So I think just as far as level setting, uh, for me, I, to keep my little simple head straight, I always looked at it as like a brand is basically a, a set of experiences that deliver on a promise. That's all it is. You're managing a whole collection of experiences dynamically, and they deliver on an idea over and over, uniquely, freshly changing. But it's all these experiences, and it's product, it's online, it's, it's everything. That is what brand is. You're just moving a set of experiences. Um, brand is a very powerful thing in the world. Uh, I actually am beginning to have disdain for this word. Uh, because I think it's becoming dangerously close to a hollow construct that uh, it's got too much baggage and too much of a mercenary kind of uh, presentation to the world, I think, at this point. But it's something that's embedded in the conversation. Uh, I think there, it's actually more about ideas. It's about living ideas than a brand. And everybody, well, I'm a brand and people are a brand. And it's getting dangerously hollow. Uh, but there is a secret code in this that's worth thinking about. And that is the fact that, as I talked about with the synchronization and the I, brands are basically bands of people. It's a band of people that come together with solidarity, with a point of view, and it's that band of people that humanizes the idea, and thinking about that is more powerful than brand. It's always some sort of band of people that come together. It may be very small, it may be large, but it's the leader whose role it is to create the conditions for that band to blow minds. That's what leadership is about. So it's not the, you know, there might be an individual who's very inspiring and has great vision and where things can go, but ultimately they're trying to create the conditions for the band to blow minds with their ideas. So I try to kind of erase brand and think about what, what band is it that you want to be part of. Uh, so a little more context as to how we see these things and how we came to see this. So we are a strategic design firm. Uh, we're not an ad agency. We don't buy media. We don't do PR. We work with other people to, to do those things, and we're networked to do that. Our focus is the strategic use of design, hopefully to build some better ideas in the world. That's, that's what our, our mission and our goal is. Uh, design is one of the most powerful things in the world. Uh, but powerful design only happens from here, and that's empathy. If you cannot think about the work you're doing from the other side and the receiving side, you're not gonna do work that's worth shit. You really have to be able to get around the other side of the things you're communicating and making is very, very important. So empathy is everything. It's the energy that fuels meaningful design, uh, and design is, is what we have committed our time to. Great design can create positive cultural change. When you get it right, when you find solidarity of intention, when you get the labor collectively right, when you get your thinking unbridled, you can create positive cultural change. And that doesn't mean that we only work for nonprofits and all that things. Positive cultural change is also about helping a, a brand be very successful financially because they maybe give back to their community and they treat their people correctly. Positive cultural change comes in a lot of different forms. But when you get design right, the design of the culture, the design of the product, everything is design, you can actually move culture. And that's what I dream about and think about. And you know, as the horses run over the hills, you need to be thinking about the relevance of what it is you're doing, because we have precious little time to do it. Um, so this is uh, our friend Peter, uh, Eric Peterson. Uh, 
out there. He's actually, this is probably about a thousand yards from here in the woods. He did a little jazz set for us. Uh, and Bruce Gibbs shot this video. So this is, uh, it's about a minute and a half long, but it'll give you a snapshot of some of the things that we do and the disciplines that we work in. So I'll let you uh, check this out. Gives you a little, oh, thank you. Um, and that is a we. I mean, the amount of people that is required to, to put together projects like that, the amount of relationship building and trust that gets built, uh, it still just amazes me uh, what it actually takes to get an idea into the world. Uh, so we've, we've been very fortunate to collaborate with some interesting people. Uh, this is the Solidarity of Unbridled Labor team. Uh, we uh, all sit at the thing called the Mega Desk. It's just a big wood table. It's in Karma Birdhouse, which is down by the waterfront, so a lot of you are probably familiar of where that's at, but that's our, our little scene. Uh, these are some of the collaborations uh, that, that we've done and that we presently work on. Uh, the reason that I want to show you this is not because of the, the list of who's who or anything. There's, there's tiny little startup brands and things like Magic Hat where you know, we, we help Alan begin that from whole cloth. So there's things that are tiny little startups and also some larger scale, which is fine. But what's most important about this is diversity of category and diversity of what it is they're doing in the world. Uh, and it's back to that revolution will be synchronized thought. One of the things when you think about building your ideas, is be really diverse in your thinking and the knowledge and the curiosity that you use to feed yourself. The biggest gift that we got from a strategy of working in multi-disciplines and multi-categories, you can learn things from video games that you can apply to beer, and you can learn things from beer, you can apply to snowboarding, you can learn things from farming that you can apply to technology. And it's recontextualizing, it's inspiring, it's cross-fertilization of relationships. That's what this design is about because that's what life is. Life is a fabric, like people's identities are a fabric of thinking. And having that ability to cross-fertilize your ideas gives you a much better sense of what people are about and what they, how they wanna feel and connect and relate to each other and relate to the brands they bring into their lives. So there's a lot of reason to think about that. So as you start your ideas, make sure your network is diverse and in multiple categories, and that's a lot of by design why we did what we did. Uh, ultimately, our manifesto is this. We believe in a living brand. We believe in ideas as living things. Uh, originally, our manifesto was the consciousness of chaos, uh, and I remember I, being this farm kid from St. Albans, I wrote this like super heady, weird, twisted, theoretic idea that was the, the uh, conscious of chaos piece. It was a book that was, when I read it, it, actually we just are about to post something on it like 25 years later. 
Uh, it's a really twisted, weird conversation, but it turned into that. Uh, ultimately, which is the belief that an idea is alive, it has to be curious, it has to be learning, it has to be willing to leave things behind and learn and change. Uh, and this has really guided everything and we've been able to continue to hone this and, and push it along the way with great partners like Burton and others. We've been able to radically experiment with that concept. Um, this is the basic model. One of the things that I wanted to show you tonight is the, the thinking you want to keep simple and clear. Um, there's a lot of incredible material out there in the world. I mean, I, I'm a huge admirer of the Harvard Business School and what IDEO does and Stanford Design. I mean, it's, there's incredible information out there, but often it gets so complex, at least for me, that I, you, can, you can barely comprehend what the conversation is about. And it's very good to keep the models pretty simple and easy to understand. Because if you're gonna move an idea forward, you've gotta be able to talk to everyone in simple, accessible ways about what you're trying to do and why. And sometimes if you turn into, you know, your whole vocabulary becomes some strategic babble, it just doesn't work. So just keep it down to earth, think very simply about what you're doing. It doesn't mean your strategy may not be wondrously complex, but you've gotta be able to articulate it in a simple, clear way. So these are some of the devices that we use. The rational, emotional, and cultural is really the heart of the ecosystem that we try to manage. So the rational mind is really what are those things that you make you different? Are you lighter, faster, newer? Do you have some IP? I mean, what's that magnet? What's the emotional magnet? Is it about trust, legacy, happiness, surprise, uh, ego? Like, what's that? And then often, you know, a lot of people in marketing talk about rational and emotional. I mean, it's not, that's not a new idea at all. But the cultural wave, the context that you're part of, what's the cultural mind and how is that changing? You have to recognize that at the base, that affects the difference you're bringing. So we try to manage that little ecosystem. And of course, the center is your living brand idea. Like, what's the why? Why, why do you matter? Why does anybody care about what you're doing? That's at the center of this. So this is the ecosystem. As you saw, it kind of moved and it was dynamic. There's times in the life cycle of an idea you may want more emphasis on the emotional. There may be a time where the competitive set changes and you need to focus on emphasis on the rational. So this is a dynamic thing, but its center pivot point never changes. It's like a universal joint. So that never changes, but there's dynamics you're pushing around it. So that's a simple part of the model. When you get it right, the answer is usually found in nature. So this is the Fibonacci sequence. That's the, the exponential math that exists in all things. And to us, this is the portrait of a great brand idea. Because you are, and if you think about how even photosynthesis works, so you're drinking in sunlight and energy, that's being processed, and then it's used to grow from there. Same exact thing with a brand. You need to create a curious culture that is drinking in knowledge and information about the culture and learning, and then it's perpetuating that out. If you get your rational, emotional, and cultural right, the core opinion leaders that are at your core and that you're connected with and that are your influencers, they will exponentially help you grow your idea. And there's times where that phenomenon really happens. You know, Burton Snowboards is a classic example. Probably there's a number of people in this room that were on some of those early chair lists where you were like the only two snowboarders on the mountain for an entire weekend. And you saw that happen. Over like a four or five year period, you saw literally that happen. Where a core culture got an idea, they understood the sideways kind of countercultural of snowboard, cultural context of snowboarding, and they perpetuated that and it radiated to an exponential scale created a whole category and an entire culture. But that is the dream. Like that, that is for us the idealized portrait of an idea. Uh, how do you manage it? Again, in the spirit of keeping things simple, it's like keep your central idea of why clear, get your strategy, your intention and mission really dialed in, like where are you going and why, what's the identity, the sort of lexicon that travels with it. You embed those into experiences. Remember the collection of experiences that deliver on a promise. And then you steward that, and that never stops. You just constantly keep learning, keep changing, getting better. That's, that's really what the whole program is about. That's the, the fundamental nature of what you need to do with your idea. Uh, and then you can determine how to, 
how to keep that alive, how do you choose to inspire your, your category. So in the end, it's really this, this concept of the revolution will be synchronized. I think more than ever, it's the ability to create collaborative interactions that are about the synchronization of disciplines, the synchronization of what your audience needs are, what do they need, what do they want, what do they feel. That's the rational, emotional, and cultural context. So this is what we believe is the future. If the meaningful brands are going to be able to do that, they're going to be able to synchronize their efforts better than anyone. What that can accomplish is this, uh, the third mind. Um, there's a lot of people who throw collaboration around as, as an idea. When you talk about synchronization and multidiscipline work and the fact that you need to function as a band of people, uh, collaboration is another word I think that's in danger like brand. Like collaboration is really important. It's like, yeah, it is, but a lot of, when you look at, when people talk about collaboration often and you read about it, it's, it's kind of a placeholder for playing nice together. That's pretty much what it's become. Like, oh, we're good collaborators. Oh, you mean you're not a jerk when you work, when you work with people? And I mean, there's collaboration at another level, and I think there's a flawed issue that's happened around collaboration that has become that. There's collabs and all these things, which are at this point have become these sort of sellout relationships, in, in my view. But collaboration has become this sort of hollow things about playing nice together. What you're really after, and one thing to keep in mind when you're thinking about naming or ideas is the B before A rule. So benefit before attribute. What's, what's the benefit? Collaboration is almost like an attribute of like, yeah, it's working well together. The benefit is third-mindedness. What you want is we want to work well together because we can create an idea that's transcendent from anything we could create on our own. So I almost feel like collaboration should be stricken and we should be thinking about third-mindedness instead. Like that should be our goal is to enter this other, this other space rather than thinking about how do we, how do we play nicely together. Uh, but it's just like brand. It's an idea that is about a desire to get to third-mindedness and these, these other level ideas. Uh, the final thing that we work toward is uh, having a very simple executional platform to work with. So this is the living brand platform. Uh, you'll see there's variables in a couple of the cases that I'll show you, because every idea is uniquely its own. They're at different places in their life cycle. Uh, but these are the parts when we can create something from whole cloth, or if we can steer an idea in a new direction, or if that's the need. These are the parts that we work towards. So a mission, vision, and positioning. Uh, a mission is about why. Yeah? I'm just curious what price they set up. Uh, I think it's, uh, what did we end up going with? Graphique is what we're using here. Graphique. 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 Yeah, with a K. And the, so the tools that we're using here are, the mission is like, why do you do what you do and why does it matter? The vision is what, is that, what does that look like in the end? Positioning is a mechanic that's pretty known and has been around for uh, many, many years. Trout and Reese are the, the people who crafted the idea of positioning, which is brilliant, but it's, it's a pretty simple thing. Know what category you're in, know who your audience is, know the difference that you're bringing and why that matters in the world. That's effectively what positioning is. It's important to be able to have that single-minded thought. The rational, emotional, and cultural magnets I talked to you about. The personification is another little technique to help you think about, okay, if, if this idea walked into the room, what would its swagger be like? You know, how, what kind of, would it be humble? Would it be smart? Would it be curious? Like personifying your idea is very important. And then all of that is imbued into the living brand idea. So this is not necessarily a tagline. It's a thought that is the guiding thought of your idea. And all of this imbues meaning into that. We design these and write these so that they can create action. Uh, it's great to be this consolidated in the editing and everything, but if you can't actually make actionable decisions with it, uh, it's not a very good tool. So this is what we've designed and found, you know, from our experience, we've been able to move things forward positively uh, with this construct. And I can show you some examples of how that works. Uh, then we apply it 
to how you radiate it out. So living brand at the core, mission, vision, and values. You go through a series of events. This is basically the internal exercise. Inform your culture, do the process, inform your culture, engage everyone, align on telegraphing it outside. Then you move to the external. You're igniting that in the public. You're enrolling people to participate, and then you're empowering them to help you grow that beautiful flower of the idea. So this is basically the strategic model of how you, how you build an idea. Uh, and again, this could be dissected and pushed and pulled, but that's ultimately what you're trying to do and what you would use as a strategic plan. Uh, this is when we get a little bit deeper. Of course, you can go even further and get into media plans and everything else, but this starts to break down. Well, who are you talking to? Who's the audience? How are they perpetuating their relationship to you differently? What's the what and why of it? You start pushing the idea forward and it starts taking shape and gets expressed in different ways. But this is basically just saying there is a method to this. There is a process by which you identify your why and, and how you build that. But it's basically just a momentum that, that grows forward and you just keep revisiting that, just wave after wave. Uh, so I have three case studies for you, uh, but before I drop into those, and these are designed to show some demonstration of all this kind of hubbub applied. Uh, but any questions at this point? Yep. Yeah. You suggest that um, great design can produce positive cultural change. Mm -hmm. Is the inverse true? Does bad design produce negative cultural change? Yeah. Design is a very double-edged and powerful tool. Absolutely. Um, I actually have, uh, I was, I was uh, guided to uh, not end up publishing this yet, but I'm still, I think I'm probably going to. But I wrote a piece called Design as God. And, I, and it's because it's intention, design is intention. And I actually, looking at a suicide bomber, as an example, that is design. By design, someone deliberately thought through how to create an object that someone would wear, and they also designed how to convince someone to put that vest on. Like, that's the other edge of, of design. And yes, design can create total evil. Uh, and I think it's our job to make sure we win on the positive side. But I, I think that's very real, and I, I think a lot about that. Design in the wrong hands, very scary thing. And that's even in graphic design. I mean, the, the Third Reich was very good at graphic design. Scarily good. Yeah, hey Jim. Traditionally, we think of brands, I think just our common understanding is that logos represent a brand like you started our conversation out with. Right. But I'm, I, I think I'm realizing as you talk through these steps and this understanding, this coming to understand process that ultimately when you're communicating your brain, you're gonna be using all the levels of communication available to us, mm -hmm. language, visual, Everything. systems, Every everything. Sense. And yeah. so it makes, it leads me to wonder, how do you reasonably manage a brand when it's as complex as humanity? Mm -hmm. You need to be it. I mean, that's why that band is so important. Like you need, it's a way of being. You know, really, truly great brands, they are a way of being. Um, and I, it is complex, and it's, it's not a simple thing. Um, so we'll, we'll get to some more questions, but hopefully that, I think your, your realization is right. Um, okay, so cases. We've got a, a couple things to look at. Some you may be familiar with, and some may be new to you. Uh, how are we doing on time, Chris? Are we okay? Yeah. Okay. Right. okay. So I was kind of drifting around a little bit. Uvero. Uh, this is something we worked on. It's, about, it's actually about two, just about two years ago now. Uh, very interesting project, interesting technology situation that we were invited into. Uh, and I'll, uh, I'll share a couple of things with you that explain the story. Uh, it was a company called Lantos, is who we started with. They were in the pharmaceutical space. They created uh, hearing aids, and they were in the, the hearing aid category, but they had a technology that was really fascinating. Lantos, again, was the brand name. It was, you know, as, as noted here, capably done, but it was very pharmaceutical feeling, very kind of clinical. This is the device that they created, which is a brilliant piece of technology. And what it is is... Uh, they actually have this wand, they take this wand and they put it into your inner ear 
and it fills a balloon with water. When warm water goes into your ear and the shape of the balloon takes the shape of your inner ear, 200,000 points of data are read of the inner, your inner ear. And then you have immediately in front of you a 3D model of exactly what your inner ear is. So it's just like your fingerprint. Both inner ears are different and you have a 3D model in front of you. Then they can 3D print that and 48 hours later they bring together the, uh, the audio component to it and you have a custom 3D bespoke earbud. So that's what the technology was and they were using it in hearing aids. Uh, it gives you perfect fit, comfort, perfect sound, and a perfect embodiment of hearing health for the future. So the insight was not just about like, oh, beats by Dre. It was about hearing health. Because when you have a perfect sealed feel and fit, it doesn't fall out, the sound is more accurate, but it also, you don't have to listen to the music or the whatever media you're putting in your, in your head as loudly. And think about the amount of media that you put into your, into your body now. There's absolute implications to that. Hearing problems are really escalating, and it's because listening to poor quality equipment, too loud. Uh, so this had a health connection to it, as well as a quality connection to it. So we did the whole living brand process. Again, it was named Lantos originally, and it was very pharmaceutical. Uh, this was where the process led us. I won't take you through every detail in this, but it'll give you an idea. Uh, so the living brand concept was transforming listening. Uh, and it wasn't just about music, it was the experience of listening. The mission, turn up the volume on hearing, health awareness, and actions while transforming the personalized audio experience. So that gives you a hint of like where we were going and why. Positioning is kind of interesting. Audio advocates, artists, audiologists, and sound engineers designing and crafting custom, custom headphones you know, this proprietary digital technology. Uh, the action lines for the rational, emotional, and cultural are important. So rationally, we need, to, we need to deliver ideas that are expertly advancing audio. We need to heighten the sound sensibility on the emotional side, and the culture is activating healthful change. So those are ideas you can use like, oh, that can inspire videos, packaging, story, environment. These are all designed to help you design beautiful, moments that embody this idea. But this all comes together with a transform listening concept. So that's an idea of how the process works. So we worked with a multidiscipline brand team and developed that. This is the launch video. So remember the pharmaceutical execution that was there? This was moving into the consumer space and starting to show people this new idea, which is Uvero. And the name Uvero, Vero means truth in Latin and you is the bespoke idea. So true to you hearing. So it takes your shape and it becomes you. So Uvero is the name we developed and this is how we introduced it, at least one of the videos that we used to introduce it. number of other things that were interesting as far as other experiences. So this is the identity. Again, everything was created around, you know, precision thinking and human form, the radiuses and straight. There's a lot of rationale, of course, behind all of the executions. Uh, you know, the sort of abstraction of the human ear and this resonating sort of fingerprint idea. It sort of feels like a modernist fingerprint. The color system needed to be pretty sophisticated in its depth and range because we had a lot of information graphics to deal with. Uh, this is actually what the 3D map looks like. So when you got your ear scanned on the monitor in front of you, you would see this, this piece executed. Uh, and there's a lot of information, as I, as I mentioned, you have to be able to communicate, like what is it doing on the sound quality and so on. We started to develop this sort of mirror of you look and feel, the sort of pulse of the, of the sound and the audio. Uh, so we drove this as an aesthetic. It's hearing in a new way. 
one size not fitting all. So these are all communication posters and digital and there's a number of, number of different benefits. The digital experience was of course very important and it's kind of a merging of the emotional and the rational. You had to take people from this to the science and the audiology side of things, just simple digital banners. This is some of the materials that was used at, used at the print location uh, when we did the uh, experience site. The packaging was interesting. Uh, when you get your ears scanned 48 hours later, you get your custom pieces. Uh, and we were able to actually have them personalized. So you get your, your own name. And this is all on file. So you could order other colors or you can get other durometers and, and things. So it was, it was kind of a cool thing that you had the chance to have people on file. Uh, and they could go ahead and continue to engage with you. Uh, this is a space that we helped to create in a, it was in a mall actually in Burlington, Massachusetts is where we did the launch experiment. And this was right during the holidays. So we created a, an environment that was about audiology and sound design and sound panels. You can see all the messaging and everything that was brought together. But what was interesting about this, uh, oh. What was interesting about this uh, space was, you know, think about an optometrist or a dentist or the di you know, different experiences we have. You needed to not only get somebody introduced to the idea, so get them intrigued, get them quickly understanding what it is, what the difference is, get excited about it. But in a pretty short period of time, you need to convince somebody to let, them, let you put a wand in their ear and fill it with water. So you, the, that psychological process of like, how do you reveal the idea? How do you get people comfortable and interested in this and pay for it uh, is really fascinating. So we managed to do this fairly successfully and it, was, uh, it got really great response. So I just thought you'd find that interesting. This is, again, continued communication and this is some of that retail experience. All right. Mamava. So how many of you have been in a Mamava or touched it, seen it, looked at it? So everybody's pretty familiar with the idea. Uh, this is uh, an idea that has been in process for eight years uh, from its, its, initial, its initial conception around uh, the empathy of, of moms and breastfeeding moms traveling. Uh, so Sasha... Uh, Sasha Mayer, who was our uh, strategist for 20 years, and Christine Dodson, who is our managing director and at uh, Solidarity and things, is now, they're both now full-time with Mamava, uh, and Mamava is in a, in a very exciting place. Uh, the momentum and the sort of cultural moment is happening, uh, which could not be more exciting. But this idea was completely born of, of empathy, and the, the intro to it is kind of interesting. So it's the greatest product ever created. Delicious, nutritionally balanced food, wonder elixir, prevents illness, reduces obesity, uh, brain development is enhanced, can be delivered on demand according to users' needs, and it's essentially free. So it comes in the most amazing packaging ever designed, and we're talking about breast milk. So that's the idea. But breastfeeding is a complex and heavy commitment to take. Uh, when you're traveling, the, the pumping and breastfeeding, the conditions for that to work, the lighting, the sound, the space, the quiet, the ability to see an image of your child, like, it is a very complex set of things that need to come together. Uh, and Sasha and Christine and I were traveling to all corners of the world to meetings, and they were young moms trying to live and deliver on this ideal that they believed was right for their family and their community and the health of their children. Uh, and I personally witnessed them in the dirty airport bathroom scene, in the back of rental cars, in client closets, you name it, it happened. And Sasha had the insight of like, design, there's got to be a way to design a solution for this because it is an unacceptable thing for women to be creating food in a dirty toilet in Newark. And she was the one that said design is the answer for this. And we just started pushing ideas and incubating and rapid prototyping and trying things and calling on friends like Gene Richards at the Burlington Airport. He was the first one that let us put one in the world. 
He saw the idea. He helped us build. He helped us build early prototypes out of plywood that looked like scary outhouses. <laughs> and but he saw the idea, and he was he let Burlington be the home of the very first Mamava. Uh, and seventh generation was there. Zutano was there. But it's that idea of synchronized again. If you have a revolution that you want to start, you've got to synchronize. So that was an example of that. So this is the, the Mamava living brand. Again, you've got mission vision, the same, the same sort of parts. Uh, but it was really, you know, this core of uh, necessity is the mother of invention is what was the birthplace of this idea. Um, one of the things that was very important, and this was when Sasha and John and I worked on this identity, it needed to be breast proud. Uh, one of the big fears was creating this suite where women would go and, and, and breastfeed. It wasn't necessarily about breastfeeding. It was the action of breastfeeding overall, which meant pumping on the road. Uh, and one of the struggles we had in the beginning was a lot of people were like, you're just trying to hide women and you don't want them to be able to breastfeed in public. That was not the idea at all. It was about pumping was the problem because it was for traveling modern mobility moms. It's moms on the go, which is what Mama Va was about. You certainly can use it to breastfeed. And another issue is a lot of, a lot of children in a busy airport, they're not going to latch. They're not, you're not going to be able to do the experience. It's too crazy. So it's a quiet, clean place where if you do need to breastfeed, great. But it's also about pumping. Uh, but it was a breast proud idea. And it was trying to get over that cultural hurdle because a lot of people did push back against it in the beginning saying, you just want to hide moms this natural act, and that was something we weren't expecting, and we had to work through that. So, there's our breast proud logo. A very likable, friendly, and optimistic is the idea. The look and feel, again, something that's trusted, clean, modern, simple as a solution. These are just some of the communication pieces that we've done over time. For Mother's Day, this you might have seen out at the airport. This is the little billboard system when you check in up at United. Uh, some of the simple postcards and tools that we use. Uh, this is a, a little video that's, uh, that's running at a number of the airports that maybe you've seen. So that, again, is an example, ideally, that you see of design used for positive change. That we've created a safe, clean, private space that the experience can be had. It's also a communication space where the app allows education to happen. It allows things like meditation to happen. You can have an image of your child there. There's all kinds of things that come together in synchronicity in this experience. So that's what it's designed to do. And it's, we now have, there's, it's getting close to 500 units in the world uh, and growing rapidly. The, the Mamava team is just phenomenal in, in what they're accomplishing. So talk it up if you can, because I think they're, they're doing an incredible job. So this is some of the digital, you know, that's a key part of it, the education, communication, the social media side of it. They do an exceptionally good job at. Uh, these are some of the other products. Another example of synchronization, uh, we worked with a group in the UK for an inflatable rental unit for festivals and things. So we worked with them and designed a way to get communication and advertising and media onto it and education on the inside. This was done in partnership with uh, Steelcase and working with Red Thread. And Owen Millen came to us and said, hey, we got this, you know, we got this connection with Steelcase. What if we created a product with them that would be an accessible price point and it could be a fleet at a place where there might be a bigger room that you could put four or five of these. This was just introduced in uh, January and is beginning, you know, it's the product line is beginning to really address the needs uh, even further. But that's again about collaboration at another level. Like the fact that Steelcase accepted the conversation and we actually have a product in the world, that's a beautiful thing. And the other reminder in that would be no matter how big the brand, no matter who it is, they're people. 
like you can get on the phone and call somebody at Steelcase and say, we have this idea. And like, you just have to remember it's all people. And that, that really carries ideas forward if they're valid ideas. So these are some of the graphic uh, things that we've done. So we do custom-based uh, graphic executions on the, on the pods or the suites. Some of you may recognize this. This was our Mother's Day art piece uh, last fall. So we did a, a diversity happy breast piece of art that we put up on our building. Uh, so this was at Karma Birdhouse for the, the month of September, I think, uh, which got some good response. People seem to, seem to like. Uh, so we have one more case. Are we good? good. Time-wise? Okay. Time for a couple questions. Okay, because you want me to do this one or we can okay. we could just go to questions? Okay. So I'll do... Uh, I'll do Burton quickly because everybody knows what, what the Burton story is. But there might be a couple of things in here that you may find interesting. So this was an incredible lab for us. We were, again, fortunate enough to have the right people synchronize at the right time. So about 26 years ago, 27 years ago, I was working in the basement of our house out in Williston. We had a skate ramp called the Swamp Thing out in the backyard. So. Uh, you know, uh, Giovanna and George Mensch is another designer many of you might know. He was the first person that ever, ever worked with us as a designer. Uh, we ended up hanging out in our basement and we were doing work with a number of different people, but it was a lot with, uh, we were doing stuff with IBM, the General Technologies Division. We were working with a few ski people, uh, but doing a lot of punk bands and things as well and a lot of music industry stuff. And I was pretty core into skating. and. Uh, so that connection, somehow Jake heard about what we were doing. There was a woman named Basie Whiteman who was the creative director at, at Burton at that time. So down in southern Vermont, they were hanging out in their barn pressing boards and making something. We were in our basement making a graphic mess. And somehow we found, found each other, both pretty naive, not knowing what really we were doing, but we were just going on instinct about ideas and, I don't know, experience in the world that had to do with mountains and outdoor and creativity. Uh, so that was how we kind of connected. And then uh, some unique things happened along the way. This is, uh, this is a, a moment that's important. I'll give you a little bit of context. So the very beginning of this is historic reference for Burton. And that point about a living idea is in a constant state of change and learning. This was one of those magical moments where you have not only the birth of a brand, but the birth of a culture you're both creating and affecting the culture of snowboarding and the, the idea of Burton. Um, one of the pieces of information that we managed to get our hands on from, that was tied to the ski industry was, uh, and I just FYI, I know there's a lot of skiers out here. I, I spent 25 years skiing too. I, I started skiing when I was like three years old. And do you know in St. Albans, the heart of the hill, Hardak? Like when you go by St. Albans, there's a little rope toe. And, I grew up on the other side of that. So I would ski there until 11 every night, and then I would ski down through the woods to my parents' house. So I probably did, I don't know, let's say 3 million runs down hard <laughs> uh, And the rope toe is still going up there. Uh, but on the ski front, it was interesting. Skiing had kind of become pretty elite. It had kind of not accepted a lot of new people into the space. It had lost the thread a little bit. It was pretty luxury. Snowboarding was more of a countercultural idea. It was a, a sideways idea. It was surf, it was skate, it was punk, it was DIY. Uh, the early equipment, if any of you were there, freaking hurt. I mean, it was, you had to want to do it. You had to want to be it. Uh, but that's what made it so powerful. And it really had a, a profound effect. But we got our hands on this stat that skiers were going to the mountain and they would only stay on the mountain for five hours and then they would be finished or they would go in for lunch. Snowboarders, the stats were coming in that they would be on the first chair to the last chair and they wouldn't take lunch and they were just so addicted to what they were doing that they couldn't stop. So we made this spot that was a $1,500 TV commercial that ran on MTV and I shot this with uh, David Schreiber and Chris was there, I think. Chris, Chris was there helping us with the mechanics. This is a total MacGyver move. We had no permits or anything. We brought this chair up into a field at the top of Mount Mansfield, and we did this with it because it was basically telling the ski industry to get off their asses and get out there. So we set a lazy boy on fire.
That was love, Burton. Um, so a fun, a fun spot, but it was one of the things that was interesting at that time is a lot of people were kind of like, yeah, that's really cool. You get to work with Burton. They just let you do whatever you want. You can just do this like really stupid, weird stuff. There's thought behind all of those things. Like there was, there was, I didn't, at that time, I certainly didn't think about it as strategy, but there was intention behind all of it. We weren't just making stuff for like the, for the heck of it. It was, it was designed for a reason to do a certain thing and communicate a certain thing. So I don't know if my batteries are dead or what here. Must be. Uh, so this is the, what was at that time the living brand idea for Burton, and they've, they've you channeled this thinking along the way. Mission and vision didn't exist. Uh, and in fact, with, uh, you know, Jake forever was just like, we don't need a stinking tagline. We don't need any of that. If people don't know why they're here, they shouldn't be here. They, it was so much a culture of just living it and being it that he was like, I'm not writing anything down. You either get it or get out. Uh, which is a very profound way of being, but it was like they are the living center of snowboarding. But over time, of course, you scale and you are inviting people into your world. You have to be able to educate them so they can make decisions. So you do have to get some kind of a thing in place where people can figure out how to decide what, what to do and where to put their energy. So sideways always became the commitment. Uh, sideways is, of course, counterculture-ness. It's against the grain of culture. It's surf, it's skate, it's snow for snowboarding. So that was the commitment, and it is committed to that. They're not about to be making skis. They're not about to do these other things. They focus on sidewaysness. Uh, I'll give you one example uh, of something that's important here. Often when people do strategy processes, uh, you'll find them fall prey to uh, kind of comfortable, obvious things. So like, what's a rational reason that people want to? Quality, innovation. Like, whatever. Like, you, that's expected. That, those are table stakes. If you're going to be meaningful at all, you have to do that. So it's just a waste of energy. You need to acknowledge that, but you got to think about, like, what do we uniquely do that nobody else does? What's a way of being that's unique to us? And one of the things I always liked about Burton and working with Dennis Jensen and David Schreiber and all the, the great band that came together at the birth of snowboarding and Burton an example like ingenuity, that's important. That's more potent than like we're innovative or we're the most quality snowboard brand in the world. Ingenuity is born of skateboarding and surf and snowboarding. What was interesting is if you talk to a snowboarder, you looked at what was going on in that culture, it was ingenuity that was driving it. A kid could flip a picnic table upside down and session it for three hours with their friends and have the greatest day they've ever had. That's ingenuity. And we would take that kind of DIY mentality and be like, we're going to a trade show. Let's not try to be the ski industry. Let's go to Home Depot and get some cinder blocks and wood and paint it and rethink how we can present ourselves. But it was an idea like that and understanding that's, we see the world differently. That gives you action that is unique to you. So when you're in your process, be honest with yourselves. If you got competitors lined up and they're like, yeah, these guys are talking about quality and innovation, don't say what they're saying, don't do what they're doing, find you. And these little things, like that's a huge action item. So try to find those distinct kind of moments. Uh, these are a series of ads. This was actually called the stream of consciousness. Uh, it was a hundred different, you know, print was king at that point. Uh, there was a uh, hundred different versions of these. That was the bone out. This is pow pow and the mau mau, uh, two tongue. Uh, this created this whole chain of ads. It was actually a hundred different ads where one ad overlapped and connected to the other. And we actually wrote a message that leapt from each one. So kids would collect all of the ads and you would have this hundred foot long message from Burton at the end of the year. So it was like this collage that was a codified way of communicating. So it was a unique way to use print. Uh, and it was, I don't know, 100 feet long. Uh, this was, we would recontextualize a lot of things. So this was based on the science of snowboarding. So if you think about 15-year-old kids were your audience. So we were like, OK, let's recontextualize school. So we took science as a theme, and we talked about it, it's what's inside that counts. And we created, like, our dealer book was a science book. So we just created this appropriated 
the advanced snowboard science and we dissected it all and we cut the boards apart and we, we messed around with a bunch of different ways of playing with that. Uh, so snowboard graphics, of course. These were the album covers that I was always dreaming of and what the, the studio got to work on. So snowboards are an amazing object. Their industrial design converged with cultural communicator. The tops and bases are all unique. They communicate in different ways. Uh, and we have had an incredible time doing it. Based on calculations over 25 years, theory is we've designed 5,000 snowboards. Uh, and every one of them was fun and interesting and unique. Uh, so leap ahead a decade. Uh, this is a, a TV spot, had a little bigger budget. Uh, it ran on MTV once, and then it ran in cinemas in Japan and around Europe. And you'll see why. So when your audience is 15-year-old males, that's the kind of thing you can do. Uh, and that's how people felt about snowboarding. So this is a series of ads. We, uh, you know, staring the future in the face, the, you know, Jeremy Jones and the other, other gang here. So it was really about looking in the eye of the future of snowboarding. There were about 30 of those done. This is a documentary series, the Red Stripe series, that was really just documenting riding and the whole riding lifestyle around the world. Uninc was an experiment that was sort of a counterculture uh, experiment within Burton. Uh, this was we will not use sex to sell snowboards and the boys in Stowe jumping on a pig. Uh, and they saw the pig as this anti-capitalist idea. We dressed them up as Kiss uh, as far as the band. Uh, this is one of, the, one of the ads that I think is really profound when you think about the way of being. Uh, remember sideways always. There are many mountains that are public land that don't allow snowboarding, that still don't allow snowboarding, uh, less of them now. But one of the things that I really saw a lot of pride in from Burton is an idea like this of sabotage stupidity was the power to the poachers concept. So we put an idea out there that if you go and poach a mountain in the morning, hike it before dawn, poach the mountain that doesn't allow skiing, get a video of it and, and get that out, uh, if you got arrested for trespassing, Jake would actually pay to get you out and he would pay your bail to do it because he wanted to make the point that these are public lands and everyone should be able to ride them. So we would actually have buses. My son and I went up to Mad River and we actually did a bus at four in the morning and we went up and we took the whole lift line at Mad River. Uh, and actually a lot of the skiers were cheering us on because they were like, you earned it. So it was kind of a cool thing. But this is an example, if you own an idea like Sideways Always, you have to live it. You got to be willing to play with pretty high stakes about what it is that you believe in. And this is an example of that, which I really admire. And the last thing on Burton, this is uh, again a leap forward like seven or eight years. Uh, if you remember this, the burning chair one, and then you remember the, the wood morning. Uh, this is Jeff McFedrich. Uh, I don't know how many of you know Jeff McFedrich or not, but he does a lot of illustration for Patagonia. He's, he does beautiful, beautiful sort of silkscreen, hand-done, gorgeous art. Uh, he had never done animation before, and we really thought, he, we had done a couple of snowboards with him, but we really felt like this was something that would speak to a wide range of people that really should be part of the snowboard experience. So this is called Snow Monkey, and it was run in theaters around the world, but it's, it's an invitation to snowboarding.
So uh, one last point about that that is, is something to think about. So say you manage to imagine an idea and you create this living idea and you have a core audience that helps you build it from the center of the flower and then you start inviting more people into it. You're eventually challenged by the fact that you've got to maintain a relationship with a core audience who helped invent you and realize you together and then you're inviting people out in the broader, broader public. Uh, they many times don't understand the super core edge, so how do you keep your authenticity? That's always one of the things that will surface with a big idea. And things like this were designed to be, can you have something that a core snowboarder would look at that and be like, that's cool. One line riding through the woods, what core rider would not want that experience? So it's beautiful to the most core rider of like the dream of just flowing through the woods. But if you're a young mom trying to get your kids into a sport and you think snowboarding might be cool, it invites them as well. It's friendly, it's fun, it's positive, it's an invitation, but it doesn't repel the core. So you'll, you'll eventually end up at a place where you get to find these pieces that have the ability to blur boundaries of invitation, which I've always found really fascinating. It comes up countless times on any idea that scales, uh, it becomes something that's, that's really uh, important to deal with. So that's a perspective on stuff we think about and do, and that's the story. I guess we can have some questions and yeah, chat for a little bit. Two. two questions. Two questions? Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Who's got a question? So what do you do? Make sure it's on. Yes, it's on. What do you do if there is a prevailing cultural inertia that runs counter to an existing living brand. And I, got, I have two examples. Okay. One is amorphous because I think it's taking shape, and that's the Me Too movement. Mm -hmm. But the other one I think is more concrete, which would be McDonald's and obesity. Mm -hmm. McDonald's forged a, a brand, probably a living brand, so that association is very glued into a psyche, especially if you're driving across the country on the interstate. Mm -hmm. But now there's a cultural inertia saying eating all this fatty food is bad for you. Well, they can change their product, mm -hmm. but they can't change the underlying way in which the perception has been built over, I don't know, 50 years, however long it's been. Mm -hmm. What then? Is the living brand now a dead brand? Mm -hmm. uh, there are times that you may have to start over. Uh, with McDonald's, one of the things that's interesting is if you, uh, if you see a McDonald's in Europe, the menu is very different. They have actually transformed the perception of McDonald's. Uh, so it's a doable thing that you can kind of reshape. Uh, and I also try to remember as well, that you, it's one really crazy example to me is uh, Banana Republic. Like when you think they, when, when we do naming projects, I always, that one, I just always scratch my head and think like, banana, like we don't even, think about the words anymore. And not that I love Banana Republic or anything, but it's like when you think about, they started as safari clothing, which lasted about a year or two, and it was like, well, that's pretty lame and not really working. Then they started down this sort of metro, kind of urban, modern thing. And now you hear the words Banana Republic and you think modern urban. And so it is, you can reshape perception if you keep creating experiences that deliver on that new promise. So I think it's pretty, pretty shapeable. Uh, the McDonald's one, that's a, that's a huge daunting thing, but culture can demand that you change or you go away. One of the things we're living in, I think, in this world now is, you know, growing up, I think we all had, you know, you can't imagine a world without an IBM or without a, a Microsoft or something. That's gonna happen. Brands are, you know, things like Uber and Airbnb are examples of like how rapidly an idea can scale now and replace everything that came before it. The days of, of a big idea being built over 60, 70 years, I'm like, whatever, that's, that's gone. And so that's gonna really change the relationship and meaning we have around brands. So I think there's an adaptability. We might find more people when they hit a wall uh, with their idea is like they may be willing to leave it because they could start something new because the scaling is changing so rapidly. So maybe a way to think about it. Hey, hey Michael. Um, thanks right. for this. Uh, 
wondering what your sort of take is on authentic branding. It's kind of like a new buzzword, at least from my perception, new buzzword um, in an age of sort of like dishonest politics and, uh, you know, sort of like scamming the audience. Mm -hmm. um, wondering what your thoughts are on sort of like speaking honesty and truth to target audiences through branding. Whew. Thankfully, I don't think people have a, have a choice. It's really interesting if the, uh, how many of you have read uh, Let My People Go Surfing, Yvonne Chouinard's book? Uh, it's actually only like three or four. You should definitely get that. Uh, he has a whole section on authentic, and he just laughs about it. What a it's like, if you have to make a product that says authentic on it, you're already wrong. <laughs> you're, already, you're already wrecked. So they actually joke at Patagonia about like making a product that says authentic. Um, I think we live in a time now where transparency demands it. You are really naive, I think, if you don't live the truth. You know, the days when, a, you know, like Bartles and James or other, like when an idea would be created and just kind of marketing-wise thrown over the wall and it's like not a real thing, it's just over. And I, and I think people are smart enough to know it. They know when they're being attempted to being manipulated. And ultimately, inauthenticity will lose. And I think that's really healthy. Uh, and it'll happen really quickly now, too. Um, so I think be who you are. You know, be real and, and respect the audience. Uh, actually, one other little thing, anybody that has, has collaborated with me over the years, like when I see materials come through, that have target audience on some brand brief or something, I want to just shoot myself. Like that whole like target audience, like, like they're your friends. It's your brother, it's your cousin, it's your sister, it's, it's your neighbor, that's who you're communicating to. And it's really, I think it's really important. That has to do with authenticity as well. Like you have to understand who you're communicating with and to. All right, so I guess that's the end. Thanks. See you.